All right, so welcome everyone to this uh, new session of our Criteo um, seminar on Bayesian machine learning, Bayesian Bayes at scale. Sorry, I forgot the exact title. Um, before I introduce uh, today's speaker, please uh, update your calendar in case you did not realize next week there's, a, there's another talk, but it's at 11 in the morning, Paris time. Uh, John O'Merod will uh, present something, but since he's from Australia, he has to talk in the morning by Paris time again. So uh, please, uh, please consider attending that talk too and be, make sure you don't uh, get the time wrong again. All right, so now it's time to introduce to, uh, uh, today's speaker. Uh, to introduce, I should say, to welcome the speaker because Aki does not really need uh, an introduction. Aki is from Alto University. He has uh, made several very significant contributions to Bayesian in France, uh, notably is part of a team developing the STAN software, which has had such a tremendous impact on, uh, on Bayesian applied statistics. I mean, a lot of people are using, developing Bayesian models thanks to the software and will not do without the software. So this software is really an enabler. It's a fantastic piece of software. Here is the most important piece of software that has occurred the last in the recent years in Bayesian statistics and applied statistics. But uh, Aki is also well known for uh, his several books. So there's a the Bayesian analysis free book, which is uh, excellent. You should immediately go to Amazon if you don't already have it in your, uh, in, your, in your shelves because it's so super useful to learn about Bayesian statistics, but also to teach about Bayesian statistics. There are a lot of nice examples you can really use in your course. There's a, Aki has a new book with Andrew Gelman also on regression, which is going to come out soon. So um, be, I'd be very happy to, uh, to, to read that one too. And Aki is telling me there are already other books in the pipeline, which is pretty impressive. But maybe not so surprising if you look at his publication mix, which is like more than 100 papers on uh, Bayesian uh, statistics and uh, uh, Bayesian computation, different applications. So, very impressive uh, list of publication, a lot of interesting stuff I'd recommend you to read. There's always, it's a long list, but in my experience, when you read like his papers, that's always very carefully done, very serious uh, research, very well thought. So a very, a very uh, well written too. So that's really a pleasure to read his papers. So I recommend you, you read them too. Anyway, sorry, I'm, uh, I'm, in, I'm talking too much. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Oh, I forgot to say, sorry. Uh, before Aki starts, you might have questions from time to time for Aki. In case this, this happens, please uh, type your question in the Q&A box, all right? You notice that uh, only the panelists are able to, to talk or the, or the other microphones are muted. So you have to type your question. Uh, and at some point, Aki might, uh, uh, might uh, have a break or uh, I might uh, interrupt Aki to, uh, to ask this question for you. So sorry, this is not very convenient, but that's the best way to go when you have a, a pretty large attendance for, um, for such a talk. All right, so again, please note you have a question, you go to the Q&A box and you type your question and wait a few minutes and I will uh, ask your question for you, All right? All right, so I think it's time to go. If I hope I didn't forget anything. So again, thank you, Aki, for accepting to give a talk in our seminar. It's really a pleasure for us. And I give you the floor. Uh, hi, all. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for the kind words in the introduction. So um, first, I want to remind that, that this is collaboration with uh, many uh, co-authors, and then there's a full list of these papers uh, the talk is based on in the end of the uh, slides and there's there was also a um, link to at least one of the papers and in andrewgelman.com uh, the blog post is uh, also the list um, available. Um, my talk is now divided in uh, these parts, so briefly about the background. First, very simple example illustrating the um, this idea 
of um, using reference models in model selection. And after this first example, I have a break uh, for questions. And I will go to Bayesian and decision theoretical justification. Um, and then in the end, more examples. Uh, overall, this using reference models uh, is not novel idea. So the earliest paper I know is Lindley's 1968, the choice of variables in multiple regression, which already gives uh, Bayesian and decision theoretical justification, which I also um, uh, give the main point for that. But in, the, in that paper, Lindley had very simplified model and thus also the computation was very simplified and um, probably that was the kind of that it didn't then spark that much um, interest and wasn't actually then used so much. Uh, one of the key components then in practical computation to make it this more flexible is so Godis and Robert, 1998, and so Christian Robert gave the first talk in this series. And I will also then mention this, this key part um, we used. There was however still a lot to develop what we've been then developing in these um, papers listed in the end. And I, I mentioned the kind of the main things that were still needed to make this um, more practical comp more and more completing and what how we, what we've learned also and like the uh, behavior. Also, this is not just um, in this Bayesian framework used um, and, and they, they, there's all, also been in the Bayesian framework, there's been others than uh, Lindley, Rodis and Robert. Bradford Neal was advocating this kind of approach even did not have a paper on, on that. Uh, and then in non-Bayesian frameworks, uh, Frank Harrell has used term cold standard. Um, Hesti Dipsirani used term preconditioning. In neural networks literature, there's been teacher network, student network, distilling, um, and so on then um, in different ways. Motivation in all, all these approaches where there's some reference so that this reference is somehow bigger or more um, uh, more complete model. And for example, we might have a lot of variables and this was what the Lindley was said, thinking that we've already measured a bunch of variables when we make a model, but what if in the future the cost for measuring these covariates, how we can then decide which covariates to actually measure in the future to make optimal predictions, but still use all the information we've already collected. Or there's a motivation for reducing running cost of predictive model. This is, uh, currently a typical example in neural networks so that for certain reasons, it's easier to train a neural net, uh, very big neural network to get good performance. But when you want to have that neural network inside a phone, you want to reduce the computation and save the battery. And then you use that big neural network to train small network which uses then less computation and uh, battery. Or we want easier explanations, just getting less covariates can be easier to explain, or we might uh, want to have otherwise simpler model where we can get and learn some basic structure, but still want to have also this richer model, which could, gives good predictions. I will illustrate the idea then that why using reference model in general, uh, whether it's a Bayesian or non-Bayesian framework helps. This is um, some simulated data. So F is some 
latent value. It could be like, like latent disease status. And now it's generated just from normal distribution. And then uh, we have Y, which could be then observed um, symptoms, um, something we can observe from the patient. And now it's just um, normally distributed, centered on that latent state, and then uh, normal distributed additional variation there. And it's easy to see from this plot that, okay, there's some connection that if you would know if you could predict something about why. But then let's say we don't know this latent disease status. Instead, we can observe many biomarkers. And in this case, we are simulating so that there are 150 XJs biomarkers that um, are related to this latent uh, disease status F. But in real life, we don't know what, all, what are the biomarkers that would be related. And then we are now also observing uh, many, many Xs, covariates that are not related to this specific um, disease, or even if they might, might be then relevant for other diseases. And now if you look at then plot, so observe, we are observing X, Js, and Y. And now I'm just showing one, some of these Xs, and so there's the question mark. And you, from the scatter plot, you can see that there's more uncertainty in the connection. And if I go through different Xs, uh, sometimes you might say that there's like correlation or not. So it's not so easy to see which axes would be actually relevant. Instead of just scrolling these plots, we can of course quantify these, uh, for example, computing our um, correlation. And then here, um, I plotted the correlation between these axes and y's. And now that I've ordered them so that 150 first ones are the, the relevant ones, it's easy to see that they have on average higher correlation. But we can also see that there's actually some overlap between these correlation values. So there's that much noise that it's not that easy just based on knowing the correlation to know whether it was actually related to this um, latent F. And this is more clear if I randomize the order uh, of these um, variable indices and not, not, it's not now clear how we should threshold the correlation. If we put a high correlation, we are missing many uh, covariates that are related. And if we have a low threshold, we are including many which are not related. So it, it would be nice if we could um, reduce now somehow this uncertainty. So if instead of um, looking at these axes, the, if we really would be able to all, uh, know the latent F. So if we compute instead correlation between axes and the latent F, so uh, not, not Xs and the noisy Y, but Xs and noiseless F, it would be much easier to see which Xs are correlated to F. But then in real life, we are not now able to observe this latent F, but we can model that. So we can use all these 500 covariates, make a model, and then these 500 covariates also include these 150 um, relevant variables, and then uh, by making a model for F, predicting F, we can look at the correlation between the predicted latent state and axes. And still, we can see uh, this good separation between relevant and um, irrelevant. So in this case, I made just computed three principal components 
uh, for the uh, coverets, and then use linear regression to predict uh, y. And from that linear regression, I then get also a prediction for f star. And if I go back with the correlation for, so here was the correlation between x's and y, correlation between x and unknown f, except known in this simulation, or x's and estimated f. So we can get some benefit from using all the variables, all the covariates, even if we are using also the irrelevant ones and predicting f star, we get some benefit to analyze individual relevance of each covariate. This is the same, same illustration, just uh, showing it now in um, different form. So on x-axis, we have correlation between x and noisy y. On y-axis, there's x correlation between x and this latent f. And then on the marginals, you can see then it's illustrating the overlap so there's an overlap in correlations when it's correlation between x and y and not much overlap when it's between x and f. And if you then add, instead of in y-axis having f, having f star, the estimated latent value, it's quite similar. So um, the reference model helps here a lot. Okay, uh, if there are now questions, I could now take some of the questions. Um, I see someone uh, raised a hand, uh, Vlad. Um, as I said at the beginning, if you have questions, please type your question in the question and answer box because for the moment, everybody besides the panelists are muted. I also need to um, get a USB cable for my headphones, just a moment. Okay, uh, so in the meantime, if you guys want to ask question, whether you raise your hand or not, please type it in the, in the box. Yeah. Take your time. <laughs> so I may, yeah, I see your question. I will ask in a minute when Aki is ready. Okay, now I'm back. So it's just my wireless headphones where of course, running out of battery right now. So Aki, we have a question. Yes. Let me read it. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what are the values used for the regression of F star from Amelia Dagervan? Sorry. Okay, so I... here, yeah. So we had 500 X's and then I just computed three principal components so PCA components from that 500 covariates. And these were then used as a covariate for linear regression. Right. And so these three PCA components were then able to get the useful, useful information from all these 150 relevant covariates which were correlating with each other. Thank you for your for your answer, I think. I don't see any other questions, so we, oh, oh, sorry, we have a second question. How does this preconditioning approach to variable selection compare with the horseshoe or other sparsity priors? Uh, so how we make the reference model, we should kind of use that kind of information that it, are we assuming sparsity or are we assuming a lot of correlating variables? So in those cases where we are assuming that that reference, like the, there's a lot of sparsity, when we are building the reference model, we should use Horsu prior for that reference model. But if we are assuming a lot of uh, correlations, it might be better than to use these kind of PCA type approaches. And so we've used both, uh, Hosu priors and PCA type models as a reference models. And then the variable selection part is then the second step. I, I, I will talk about more about this separation um, soon. Thank you. I see no other questions, so you, you may proceed. Okay. So 
Uh, sorry, Aki, there's a third question. Okay. You just appeared. I'm sorry. From Sebastian Weber, are there any quality requirements for the reference model? I mean, bad models could actually help this approach. So how can we ensure that the reference model is good enough? We will never have the true model. Yes, I will answer that in, in the next slide. All right. Okay. So, of course, we start with assumption that we are able to build good models. How to build, build good models? One way is to use Bayesian uh, approach. So first of all, we want to integrate over all, all the uncertainties. So if we don't know something, include it in the model and integrate over that uncertainty. Uh, we assume we have made model checking and if there's clear problem with the model, then we extend the model and make it better. So I'm assuming that in the, that we have somehow already checked that the reference model is good. So of course, if the reference model is really, really bad, if it's just predicting noise, it's not useful. So assuming that we've been able to build good model as, uh, and with using all the tools in Bayesian workflow, which would be then a topic for another talk. Um, and then when we have this big model, we consider model selection as decision problem. Um, so it's important that we first build this reference model, taking into account all the possible prior information we have, and like the choice whether to use sparseness priors like horseshoe or whether to use PCA should be decided based on what we know about the phenomenon. We should not try to enforce like our um, utility or loss functions to prior. So first make a good model which can make good predictions and then consider conditionally on that good model what we can learn. And this is, this was Lindley's very important point, and if you read the paper, very clearly uh, um, explained point that we then do the decision conditionally on the reference model, which is um, our best possible description about the future data. Then, uh, so we have this full reference model, and I, I then say that full posterior is then for this reference model. And then we ask the question that, what if we replace this with some constraint distribution? And when we integrate over this constraint distribution, how this constraint distribution should be selected so that the predictive distribution changes as little as possible. What are these kind of possible constraints we might have? We could say just that what if the constraint distribution have only point mass at some uh, theta zero so that we get optimal point estimates. So which point estimate would give a similar predictive distribution as when we are integrating over the full posterior? Or we could say that in this constraint distribution, some of the coefficients have to be exactly zero. But how we then modify Q otherwise, that when we integrate over Q with some constraint to zero, the predictive distribution is as similar as possible compared to if we integrate over the full posterior. And it could be even that this full model could be something like neural network or Gaussian process, but actually this constraint model is linear model. And then we get easier explanation. I will have an example of that um, later where they, they can be kind of bit of different type of um, models too. So here's an, an illustration of this um, kind of that how do we kind of the maths, these predictive distributions. 
this is logistic regression. So there's two classes. So on the right hand side in the in the plot, you see there are uh, red class uh, observations from red class and observations from gray class, and we've made a model which then predicts the probability of the class and the curve come from uh, integrating over the uncertainty. And on the left hand side, we see the draws from the posterior distribution of the coefficients beta one and beta two. And now um, we could then ask, for example, what would be the point, optimal point estimate? So this would be optimal point estimate so that the predictive distribution. So here, how we predict what are the probabilities for different x's, x1, x2 combinations, that it would be, so we want these to be as similar as possible and then choose the point estimate here that way. Or we can then also constrain that in addition, we want that what if V1 is forced to be zero, what would be the optimal prediction then? Um, or what if we then constrain V2 to be zero? And now these were all now just point estimates for easier illustration. We could now also then ask it how we actually then project that distribution to a constraint distribution. And this was uh, Goldis and Robert paper idea that in general, it's quite difficult problem. But if we do the projection by, for each posterior draw, so we take each of these full posterior draw and then each draw we project that. What would be the best corresponding constraint draw for one of the draws? And this way we get these projected constraint draws. Uh, or if we then constrain uh, that the B2 has to be zero, we get these constraint draws. Aki? Yes. Sorry to interrupt, but there's a question by Sergio Garrido. Does this Q theta distribution have any relation to a variational distribution? There's a connection in a way that if we could also do the projection so that, um, so usually in variational uh, approximation, uh, this variational approximation distribution has some parametric form. We could also here choose that Q to have a parametric form. Um, and then it would be kind of uh, one type of variational inference. Difference is that in variational inference, the usually the divergence is between uh, the full posterior uh, or, or and then the approximation and not looking at the predictive distribution. There's also, um, at least one paper uh, trying to do it also looking at the predictive distribution. But it's, it's um, again, in general, a bit difficult, but then by doing it this like draw by draw, it's actually easy. But still, yeah, there is a connection. So, so we want to replace the full posterior with some constraint Q so that the predictive distribution changes as little as possible. And then uh, we are now measuring this change with kullback lipo divergence from the full predictive distribution to this uh, constraint predictive distribution. The benefit of this approach is also that as we are projecting this full posterior to the constraint, the prior part is also projected. And there's no need to define priors for submodels separately. So we need to think about the prior information only for that our rich reference model. Um, if we would otherwise choose a model where we constrain some of the coefficients to be zero, and then just do Bayesian inference conditional on data, we would be throwing away that information about that covariates 
uh, dot which coefficient is set to zero. But in this projection, we are also uh, still um, keeping part of that information which is related to features which contributed to the reference model, even if their coefficients are supposed to be zero in the constraint model. And this also now solves the problem how to do the inference after the model selection, because we are conditioning the inference still on the full model. So now we, there was a kind of the idea that we can do these projections to constraint models. If we think about then uh, variable selection, there are many different combinations which coverage to include or features as, as in this sentence uh, zone. And so we need to do some kind of search through these different variable combinations. For a given model size, it's easy that we choose just better feature combination which has the minimal projective loss measured for example, with the KL divergence. And then otherwise, as soon as we have um, like tens of variables, uh, we are not able to go through all the combinations and we can then use search heuristics like Monte Carlo search. And we've been using forward search. And also we've uh, then um, in one of the papers proposed this proposed this L1 penalization so that we can get similar uh, path through the model space as in Lasso, uh, like similar computational complexity, but we get overall better results than um, Lasso as I show, show you soon. And then when we have then this um, search path through the model space and we know that what is the kind of the best projected model for each model size and then we need to decide what would be the appropriate model size and we can use cross validation for that and then one of the um, new things we propose is how we can do the cross validation computationally efficiently over many of these search paths. Uh, related to this important sampling cross-validation we have paper uh, about. And so here's the example. So this is the, the same simulation example where we had uh, F, um, Y is noisy observation of F, and then we had also Xs, which are noisy observations. Um, now there's 50 observations otherwise uh, actually the same. Um, you can see mean squared error plotted here. The dashed horizontal line is showing the mean squared error for the reference model. So this kind of PCA plus linear regression. And then you can see lasso path. And uh, so we can get, some, uh, we can't get with the lasso to the same error, we can get quite small model around maybe 10, 15. And then if we go to less, the error starts to increase. One of the problems with lasso is also that the, the, like the basic lasso, uh, it's regularizing also those variables which are still included. And then there's uh, um, the alternative a relaxed lasso, where after deciding which variables to include, refit without regularizing them. And we can get um, even smaller models, but still we don't get close to the reference model approach. And then using this projection, so for each number of coverage, it's found what's the optimal combination, and then uh, we now just need to choose what is the model size and, and we can reach this. The fact that they, the blue line goes actually below the reference model, it's, it's not um, kind of significant 
difference and this can um, happen by like the um, small uh, differences in, in how these um, predictive distributions behave uh, when projected, but that, that's not kind of that what we would assume to happen every time. And uh, in addition of mean squared error, same plot using log predictive density. And um, we can see that with this reference uh, projection of the reference model, we get better results. And, uh, and there's more results in the paper for comparing uh, Lasso and with real data sets too. Um, it's good that the, the, in the seminar series title, it says machine learning at scale, but it didn't say that it has to be big scale. So continue with small scale example, um, 251 observations, uh, predict body fat percentage. The reference value is obtained by immersing person in water. So weighting the person first without water and then weighting them uh, when they are immersed in water and also like estimating the volume, how much water they are um, displacing. And then there's um, another way that like want to have faster, cheaper, um, something that doesn't need this big tube that we can um, measure circumference of person at different parts. So here the theory is now the value which was obtained from immersing person in water. And then there's background information eight, and then weight with the scale, height, measuring, um, measurement tape. And then these the rest of these neck, chest, abdomen, and so on, they are circumference of that body part. And now the question would be that we may assume that all these circumferences tell something about body fat, but in the future we would like when we are, we want to make these measurements quickly. So which of these circumference measurements we would make uh, to like, well, what is the minimal set of them? that we get the same accuracy as if we would use all of them. And you can see this, this, uh, this is correlation plot so that uh, this strong blue is high correlation and you can see many of these measurements are correlating now with this target variable theory. Um, okay. hmm? uh, sorry to interrupt, we have a question okay. from uh, David Kohns. Uh, were the lasso results obtained in the previous slides obtained as lasso on the projection, or was that plain lasso? So these uh, lasso results are, so there's a pl plain lasso and relaxed lasso result. All right, thank you. So the dot, dotted line for lasso and continuous line for relaxed lasso. Okay, so here are then if we fit a model predicting Siri uh, with these other, uh, these coverages, and we can see, okay, abdomen has a coefficient clearly away from zero, but then it's not clear which other uh, measurements we should include. But we can now use, again, this projective predictive variable selection approach. Um, oh, before that, so, so here we had this, um, Weight, for example, has really a lot of uncertainty, overlapping with zero. But this, when we look at the joint distribution of height and weight, they are not jointly overlapping zero. So weight and height can tell you something about body fat, but marginally, it's difficult to see from these marginal plots how they act. So because of these correlations, the marginals doesn't help, but then doing this uh, projection predictive variable selection search, we can see that, okay, about two 
of these coverages can give the same performance as the full model. Here now, this is difference to the baseline. So for the root mean square error, zero difference to the baseline model is reached almost um, with these two, two variables included. And we can check what the variables are. They are then abdomen and weight. And you can now see on the left-hand side, there's the marginals of the reference model, the original full model using all. And on the right-hand side, there are uh, the projected posterior for abdomen and weight. And we can see that, okay, if the abdomen circumference increases, there's more body fat. And then given certain abdomen circumference, if weight increases, there's less body fat because if the abdomen circumference doesn't change and weight increases, it's probably more muscle um, added. Okay, um, now there could be also chance for questions related to this, um, this example, or I can continue with the bit of. So for the moment, I don't see any question, uh, okay. but maybe. Yeah, that there's a soon another possibility for the pause, so. Okay, let's do that then, let's go. Um, so initial aim when we were um, thinking about this was that uh, the most important part is this predictive performance. So we, yes, we want to have smaller set of variables because of reduced measurement cost or easier to explain. Um, but really um, looking at this predictive performance. But then there's also people asking, can it find the true variables, like what is the false discovery rate? So let's think about this specific example again. So all of these circumference measurements are relevant. So they are somehow predictive, but because they are highly correlating, it's still enough that we have just abdomen and weight and then adding other circumference measurements don't help. So um, there's a question that like, what do you mean by true variables? In many cases, we have included a lot of variables because we are assuming that they are somehow predictive but it still doesn't mean that we need to use them all for a certain time, uh, predictive accuracy. But then, of course, there can be also cases where we are including much more and there's reasons to assume that there would be then um, also irre irrelevant variables and we've made also simulations for these. But even if we now in this case think that, okay, some, all of them might be relevant. We might look also at the stability of this approach. And if we go back to this simulated example, if we repeat the simulation, we of course get different correlations because of randomness in the simulation. For this body fat example, we can get similar variability by doing bootstrap data sets. Here this plot shows that uh, in yellow bars, what is the percentage that how often we choose certain variable when using, so with the yellow color, when using this projection predictive approach, shorthanded broad spread. And we see optimum is selected always, weight uh, more than half of the time, and then so on. And as a comparison, there's now um, commonly used just stepwise maximum likelihood linear regression. And you can see that that has much more variability. Here's also, as the tables, we can see that in, in these bootstrap data sets, 40% of time selected abdomen and weight. And then there are other cases. We can also see that ProJPred is selecting smaller models all the time and stepwise selection with maximum likelihood it's selecting bigger models, but there's also much, much, much more variation. So using this um, broad spread, um, we get reduced variability, of course, but in, 
we are not claiming that it could do perfect uh, in case of noisy finite data. So there's still some variability under data perturbation. Now we, we've been also then thinking that, okay, which part is the most important for this good performance? So um, we are using Bayesian inference for the reference model. We are using the reference model uh, overall um, for these restricted models. And then we are also using the projection for submodel inference. It doesn't um, affect that much the variable selection part, but also then like the predictive performance it specifically affects. And it turns out that um, the reference model part is really important and we can improve other approaches also by including the reference model. It depends of course on, on the bit of case that how much these other parts uh, matter. And of course the Bayesian inference is, is, is a good way to make these good reference models. So if you use then simulated data where we actually know that some of the um, covariates are um, irrelevant, we get very good predictive performance, small false discovery rate, and we can also improve others uh, just by even just by replacing the data with predictions from the reference model. The difference was that in this um, Bayesian approach, we are not just replacing the data with predictions because we are using also the full model, the reference model predictive distribution. So the whole predictive distribution is used, uh, not just the point estimate. And here's a then plot showing, uh, so each subplot is with different data size, different correlation, uh, x-axis false discovery rate, y-axis root mean square error. The red diamond is showing the broad spread results. So false discovery rate in this simulation close to zero, root mean square small. And then as a comparison methods doing stepwise selection, uh, either using base inference or maximum likelihood and the line connecting then this green uh, circle or um, uh, green, green and blue uh, circles with green and blue diamonds. That is the kind of the how much benefit we get by replacing original data with the reference model predictions and we can see Root mean square specifically for the selected model gets much improved and little bit of improvement in false discovery rate. So this would be again, good point uh, to get some questions. Yes, Aki, we have three questions actually. Uh, Jersey asks, did you retune the reference model for bootstrapped data? Uh, so in the bootstrapped case, we, for each bootstrap it data, we repeat the whole uh, inference process. So we fit again the reference model and do the projection and so on. Uh, next question from Vlad. Does this approach also work for models with heteroscedastic noise? Yes. So of course it, it depends on your software implementation but uh, theory says yes. And third question from Chantanu, clarification question. If one has to empirically decide whether to use reference model or shoe, for example, for variable selection, the idea is to check correlation between the predictors and the dependent variable. Or is there another theoretical conceptual reason? Uh, so there's no, choice between horseshoe and reference model because horseshoe can be also part of the reference model. And, and the horseshoe itself doesn't provide yet variable selection. It's good prior, but you still need after using horseshoe prior, somehow decide which variables to include or not. And if you decide some variables to include, then there's again a problem also, how do you make the inference after the selection? Okay, we are done with a question, so 
Okay. If you'd like to proceed. Yes. Um, very much. So in the, um, so far I've like focused on having minimal set of variables that give similar predictive performance as the full model. Sometimes we might, might want to also find all the variables which have any predictive relevance. And we can use this broad spread approach iteratively. Uh, based on our experiments, uh, there can be specialized algorithms for this which perform better. But even in those cases, uh, using the reference model improves those specialized algorithms even more. And so this complete variable selection was not something that we were thinking originally with broad spread. And so far we've just tested and we haven't come up yet. Maybe there's a better way how, how this approach can be used for this complete variable selection. Um, Donald Williams uh, from UC Davis made a co-authored paper, uh, how we can use this approach also for networks as networks can be seen as just a bunch of um, linear or generalized linear models. We can find sparse network structures. Um, we have paper out soon on extension of this for multi-level models and GANs and so on. Um, as the seminar title has this at scale, so far the biggest number of variables we've tested is 22,000. And in that case, it was 96 seconds for creating a reference model and 14 seconds for the projection predictive variable selection. And these were like single core results. So uh, modifying the code to use GPUs or multiple cores would of course make these even faster. And it's reasonable to assume that we can go to much uh, bigger data sets and still keep the benefits of use of reference model and projection. Um, and the seminar series title has also machine learning. And so this one is uh, yeah, from our group, Homayun, um, I did this uh, so that if we use some machine learning, complex machine learning model, and in this case, uh, example is BART, uh, so Bayesian um, regression trees. And the nice thing is then that we are integrating the, over uncertainty, but then the downside is that then the end result is many different looking trees. And then how do you explain, uh, you need to explain all the many trees. Cart makes just one tree, which would be easier to analyze and explain. And then we get benefit of both of these. So first making BART for good accuracy, and then projecting that to a single tree, and which can be made just by making using BART as a reference model, and then draining CART using that reference model uh, predictions. And here's the results, root mean score error. Uh, the green dashed line is now this part. And then um, the blue and red line are then card fitted. So the blue line fitted to this part model and the red line fitted to the training data. And when we increase the uh, tree size, we can see that it's better to fit the card to part than directly to training data because what was able to better like the filter and the noise out. And so this is the last slide uh, before the references. Just want to um, say that the, like the good reference model filters out noise, which makes it much easier to search for simpler models. And I of course favor this specific Bayesian decision theoretical approach uh, we call broad spread, projection predictive variable selection, which can also be used for other things than variable selection. But it can be used also for other algorithms and models. And then 
when we use this uh, broad spread, we have software for that. We have this good Bayesian decision theoretical justification. We have excellent rate of fit in accuracy, model complexity, uh, excellent false discovery rate in minimal set selection, and can be useful for also identifying all the relevant features. And we have a um, lot of things uh, coming in the future. I'll leave the preferences here and ready to answer more questions. Um, uh, thanks a lot, Aki. Um, David, do you want to uh, chat? Uh, okay, thank you, David, sorry. I'll read them out for you. Um, okay. So one question is, uh, can you elaborate again how the reference model is defined? Uh, say it might be. <laughs> Can you elaborate again how the reference model is defined? So the reference model can be any model you think is good model. And of course you should do a model checking to verify that it's good model. But there's no other restrictions for the reference model. Um, what was the sample size in the P equals 22K model? I guess there's a question about scaling, so. Yes, here it was less than, less than 100. Okay. Um, 80 something. Yeah, it's in the title. It doesn't have to be everything at the scale as well. Um, uh, have you studied the properties of the proposed approach under covariate shift? Actually, this is something I was thinking about too. Uh, so we, we know, um, how to modify this, if we have, uh, like assumption, what the coverage shift would be in the future. So yes, this can be, uh, used for that, but we haven't, we don't have any, um, actual experiments for that. What but are we but it's kind of the part of that when we are doing this, um, computing the divergence uh, between the, from the predictive distribution of the full model to the reduced model. And then we are weighting that currently just uh, at the locations of observations. And then we could reweight that and we could also compute these predictive uh, distributions in any location so we can also Think about what would be um, if we if the coverage shift is going to make us extrapolate that in this extrapolation area, what would be the assumed best sub uh, restricted well, model? Right, because the measure of this fit, I suppose, is is dependent on the marginal distribution of x, which you can either use the samples or build an, yet another model of this. Yeah. I, I suppose. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, that was a thought I was having is if, for example, you have, if you've had collinear a problem, which I think you, your example was, uh -huh. you were able to get away with just a few variables. But say you had a new data point that you're predicting with that was not collinear, you've lost that ability to tell that it wasn't on the original plane. Um, I suppose this is just a cost of, of the simplification. But um, that was a, th do you have anything to? Yeah, you can solve that. Uh, if we have coverage shift, then it, it is of course can be sensitive to our assumptions that what we expect to see in the future. But the, the kind of this, if we have some sensible assumptions, these could these can be included. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, uh, is cost validation needed only for computational efficiency or can we use something like uh, SSVS? I'm not sure what that is actually, or reversible jump, like step for selecting the model dimension. Um, so SSVS is one kind of stochastic search. Yes, we can use stochastic search. The cross validation was, was used to, after any search through the model space to decide what would be good model size. So if I, if I go back to, um, like here, 
we see that uh, with zero variables, we are far away. With one added, added variable, we are still away from the reference model thing. And then the, like, we start to get this question that when we are close enough, this black line, the estimated predictive performance for the restricted model is based on cross-validation. And okay. the good thing is that we can, all, in a way that that cross-validation is not, is, we are able to do this cross-validation so that it is considering that what if we leave out one observation, how the search path might also change. So, so in a way we are doing the correct, correct thing. And, and the papers have um, plots for showing uh, what's the difference between looking at the kind of the predictive performance based on the reference model or, or the cross validation. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, okay. I, I, someone's tr said, I tried ProjPred for um, a lot of features, 485,000 features for 450 individuals um, and cho choose P0, P0 equals five and calculate the whole shoe prior. But the estimate for Stan GMA was too long. It took me more than 24 hours to run. Um, I'm not sure what I'm missing the prior reference selection. So that might be, I mean, I don't know if there's yeah. a good answer now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so for these uh, very large number of variables, I recommend using then uh, like the supervised PCA or iterative supervised PCA instead of Hosu. So this is now again, that, so that we can divide the problem in two parts, how you make the reference model in reasonable computation time. And after you have the reference model, how do you do the project from predictive variable selection in reasonable time? And if you had 400,000 variables, that's a lot for Hosu. Okay. And, and especially for Hosu combined with MCMC in France. Yeah, it sounds pretty tough. Um, can the reference model and target model be any arbitrary models? Is, are there any best practices for selecting the reference target model? Um, yeah, so, you know, uh, the reference model can be arbitrary in a way that after we have the reference model and we have uh, these predictive distributions or if we have used also MCMC for inference, we have posterior draws of the predictive di distributions. That's all we need to store and in a way we can forget what was the reference model. Just the predictive distributions or draws of those is needed. Uh, doing the actual projection, it helps if that submodel. So if we are doing specifically this KL divergence minimizing projection, it helps if the it's easier for exponential families and it's easier for uh, models which have less parameters uh, than the number of observations we have, but we can extend this. So we have paper also doing this for Gaussian processes. We just need to modify then the projection rule. We can do it, you do this like for regression trees and neural networks just by, uh, instead of doing this KL projection, just use the reference model to produce uh, like, filtered, less noisy training data, and then just use any, your favorite way to fit those restricted models. So they are different options. Okay, interesting. Um, with highly correlated predictors, will PCA re regression perform better than hierarchical normal regression, um, hierarchical prior on standard de deviation of, of regression slopes? Um, so this P 
PCA, supervised PCA, they are computationally efficient way. And uh, so that's the reason why we use them. They, it's, um, there's no universal answer that what would be the best, it depends. Um, I think there's a similar question in, in this in so-called Bayesian modeling um, or by Michael Bentecourt or using complex penalized priors by Dan Simpson, you create a model from simple models by adding more complexity. Here is kind of the opposite. Do you see it as an alternative or rather a method of creating more pro uh, production ready models? Um. So when we are making the reference model, it's likely that we start from simpler models, but um, specifically this, and then, then like start with the simpler models and then do posture predictive checking and all the usual uh, model checking as part of the workflow, and then end up eventually something that we are happy with. And then we can check that, okay, which of the parts are actually needed. But the variable selection specifically is kind of that, um, it is assumed that you've already decided that these variables you have might be relevant or the application expert you are working with are, is saying that we assume that these are somehow relevant or uh, some of these are relevant, but we don't know which one. And then there's, um, kind of starting from the simpler and adding one variable at a time would be quite time consuming. If you can put everything in and then let the machine decide that, okay, here are the variables which uh, contain some useful information. After that, it might be that you learn that uh, you're surprised that what variables it included. And we are, um, so we, have also this kind of experimental prototype for the user to then look at. Um, so user sees what the machine says that this would be the minimal set, which gives the similar performance as the all. But then user can see also how the remaining variables are correlate, correlating, which can be useful information. And there might be that users would say that, oh, that one which was not included would be actually easier to measure in the future or might have more reasonable causal explanation. So there's still, after doing the variable selection, the workflow continues learning more about um, what these variables are and what they are telling about the actual uh, phenomenon we are modeling. I might just add a follow on question from myself on this one is it, it seems, I think there's maybe an apparent, but maybe only apparent disagreement with your co-author, Andrew Gelman, who's always saying, don't set things to zero. There's, you know, at least in social science, nothing much is zero. Um, is it only an apparent sort of disagreement? Is it, um, no, because that's why we are adding everything there and we are um, in this minimal set selection, we are not saying that those left out variables would have zero coefficient or zero relevance. We are saying that that minimal set is already giving similar predictive performance as all. But we are, that's why it was, it, for example, it took us quite a long time before we uh, wrote the paper talking about false discovery rate, because false discovery rate is sensible thing only if we assume zero effects. And then, um, but since this was kind of re reoccurring question, we wanted to answer also for those who may think that there would be uh, 
zero effect. So I agree with Andrew that okay. it's, it's quite likely in social sciences, biology, that there are a lot of these um, small effects. And then like this minimal variable selection is just selecting the biggest ones which are sufficient for good predictive performance. Yeah, so the reference model is not, it, it's, it's a simplification. It's not because you believe that zero is a special. Yeah, and, and in like the reference model, if we use horseshoe prior for the reference model, the horseshoe prior is also saying that, uh, not that some of them are zero, just that some of the coefficients are likely to be close to zero. Okay, yep. Um, so can you clarify if we use a reference model, then do we not use horseshoe prior and instead use the reference model? I think I missed the point about using reference versus horseshoe prior. Um, so the reference model can use horseshoe prior. So if when we are building our reference model, if we assume that many of the uh, predictors are not relevant, I would build the reference model using horseshoe prior, but still this is the kind of the including all the variables. And then when we have this horseshoe reference model, we can do the variable selection. Can so, we have, so we have, uh, um, in one of the papers, we are using spike and slap priors also. And now, and then we had the um, addendum to that paper showing also results with horseshoe prior as, uh, for the reference model. And then the latest paper is then using these PCA type reference models. Okay. Um, can the model take into account effect modifiers? So for example, a binary variable could be modifying the effect of a continuous variable through an interaction. Uh, yeah, so we have um, this the support for interactions coming to broad spread software soon. So there's all already so there's a branch in GitHub repo if you are eager to test. Okay, um, and our last one for now is uh, does broad spread have any bearing on structural or causal modeling modeling? Um, can you say again? Does ProjPred have any bearing on structural or causal modeling? Uh, so currently, um, so we are getting more, more of the like support for structure, not specifically like the um, in sense of SEM. Uh, although there's of course overlap, like most of the SEM is just uh, modeling. Um, the the main, main point is now just uh, finding the variables with best predictive performance. And then that's of course different, doesn't yet take into account causal assumptions. And um, in a way that variables which improve predictive performance are not always causally sensible. That's why I also mentioned this, the, like the, um, that after getting the result, the workflow continues in a way that it, it, the user needs to check that whether the selected variables are sensible, taking in the additional causal information. So these are, um, so the broad spread can be used also when thinking about causal models, but it can't uh, do the causal assumptions on behalf of user. Okay. Um, would you introduce the paper that you just mentioned that PCA is used to define the reference model? So here, um, in the reference list, now the first one is using uh, PCA or supervised PCA. Uh, and then there's a reference for the specific um, 
supervised PCA and iterative supervised PCA papers also by Pironen. Um, and then we used uh, Horsu. Uh, so in this paper, we used Pycans Lab, and then there's online addendum using the Horsu for that. Um, this one used also uh, for the networks. Okay. This one is showing the results for the false discovery rates, showing extension to Gaussian processes, and then cards and bars. You have been very productive. <laughs> um, there's two more. Do you want? Do you have you got time for two more? Yeah, I have time. Um, so they're both clarification questions. First one was, could you give intuition why fitting the models with something else other than the actual data that gives better results? Is it because the reference model removes the noise of the individual variation? Yes, exactly. So um, these modeling assumptions we put in the models help to remove noise and then fitting model to less noisy data gives us uh, better, better results. Uh, in a way, we are not able to overfit to the data. We are only able to overfit to the model, to the reference model. Of course, if the reference model itself is highly overfitted, then the the submodels will also be overfitting, but if the reference model is good, that it's not severely overfitted. Uh, and of course, then there's the, the other side that we could have a, what if the reference model is severely underfitted? Then of course we can't go beyond that underfitting. But it helps in a way that if we have a large number of these submodels to compare, that we are kind of limiting that they can't eat separately fit to different parts of the noise. Like in variable selection, each covariate combination has a different type of noise. But fitting to the model, all these submodels are all the time fitting to the same target. So it uh, works as a kind of the gate. The reference model, uh, reference model works as a gate between noisy data and these submodels. Okay. Um, and last one is uh, compared to the frequentist lasso approaches, which set the coefficients to zero, post priors and generally need some additional stricter prior changes to ensure the posterior coefficients are set to the zero. Which uh, one? Can, can you go a bit slower? Sorry. Um, uh, compared to frequentist lasso approaches, which set coefficients to zero, horseshoe pr priors generally need some additional stricter prior changes to ensure the posterior coefficients are centered at zero. Which ones would you recommend to use? So in general, uh, uh, even if we would be using spike and slab, which has point mass at zero, when we look at the posture uncertainty, the whole posture is not concentrating exactly to zero. And that's why we have these two phase approach first, just fit the model, which gives good predictions, and then consider separately the variable selection as a decision problem. The lasso is kind of um, mixing these two things. It's mixing the model and the decision problem. And it just happens that in, in that case, like um, doing two bad things is actually quite good, but for example, using um, lasso type of prior and then doing full MCMC, it doesn't, or full Bayesian inference doesn't work that well. So it's, it's really just happens that in, in, in lasso mixing of these approaches happen to work, but in Bayesian approach, then we need to do first um, good model with good inference, and after that, we can have the variable selection using good decision theoretical approach. 
Sometimes being beige is a bit harder, I guess. Um, anyway, um, that's all. That's all. So uh, thanks very much. It's been really fascinating. Um, people can't clap or anything. I'll, I'll clap for you. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So yeah, I think we're done with questions. Yeah. Thanks for all who asked questions. It's uh, much more interesting to give a talk when getting some feedback, <laughs> like which, which parts were not clear or which part I should um, next time also explain better. Yeah, it's more fun, I think. Um, so yeah, thanks again. And uh, yeah, we have uh, John Ormer next week, if, if you'd like to uh, register. Um, okay, some people are saying clap and thanks in the questions, so. Cool. Ha, <laughs>